Physics notes, units, unit 10.1 to 10.5, rotational kinematics. Start with a quick review from unit six, uh, talking about rotational motion or angular. I kind of interchange those two words. Most books just use the word angular, but some books use the word rotational. Same thing when I talk about it, things that are spinning or rotating or going in a circle. So some of the things that we've already had from unit six is we have delta theta, that's an angle. I mean, in this diagram here, it looks about 45 degrees, which is basically, I think, pi over 4 radians. You don't need to memorize that, but you might remember that from math class because we need to convert these angles from degrees to radians. We'll be practicing that. So that's your angular displacement. All right. Now, delta S is arc length. It's not really a straight line, but it's basically if you measured that in meters, that's how long that from point A to point B is if you made that straight. So it's a linear thing if you make it straight. It's measured in meters or centimeters, but you convert to meters. Omega, this W looking thing, is angular velocity. It can be clockwise or counterclockwise. Mostly we just look at the speed, but we can also do clockwise and counterclockwise like we did with torques. But with the, with the st uh, static equilibrium for torques, nothing was spinning. Now we're going to have things that, are, that actually spin and they are all, they're going to accelerate while they spin. So that's the, uh, the next step that we'll be taking here. But the definition of angular velocity is the change in the uh, angular position over the time. Uh, another equation that follows from that is omega, rotational speed, rotational velocity, equals tangential velocity, that's v sub t, it says it here over in the explanation, that that v in that equation stands for the linear tangential velocity for something going in a circle, which would be perpendicular to the radius, tangential to the circle. Uh, the tangential velocity divided by r, we'll use that equation probably more often than either of the two above it. Once again, as a reminder, two pi radians, one full circle, two pi radians is 360 degrees. Another relationship up here for a full circle, the circumference of a full circle is two pi r. Not to be confused with the area of a circle, which is pi r squared. We won't be doing much with the areas of circles. We'll be doing a lot with the circumference of a circle, two pi r. All right, that's all review. Now here it is, are some new things, or at least one new thing, probably the most important new thing. Well, there's a lot of new things, but this is probably the most central piece right now. We have this symbol, it's alpha, Greek letter alpha. I have that way over here to the right. So alpha is a new letter, a new term here. It stands for rotational acceleration, things that are spinning and then they start to spin faster and faster and faster or slow down. That would be negative acceleration, negative angular acceleration. So it's the rate of change of angular velocity. And what you're going to find here is that there's an analogy between linear systems and rotational systems. I'm going to make the argument here in a few minutes with tables that basically all the equations are the same, all the problem solving techniques are the same, just different letters. Hang on to that thought. But so instead of like linear acceleration where we have A, A is delta V over T, alpha is delta omega, which is rotational velocity instead of linear velocity over time. So it's really the same equation, except for now it's all applied to rotational systems as opposed to linear systems. So the math is gonna look basically identical, just different units and different letters but there's enough extra letters that we have to keep things straight and organized. And this page here, as I go forward, is going to try to keep that organized. A little bit of a summary here. All right, we just went over this, delta theta equals delta S over R. So basically, if you rearrange that equation, you get this. Over in this column are some very helpful, useful relationships that we'll be using probably more often than the stuff on the left here, these equations on the left, but we'll use the the ideas on the left as well. So these were the definitions or relationships. Uh, this was from unit six. Rotational speed is rotational displacement over time. And now uh, rotational acceleration is change in rotational speed over time. But here are some, so we're gonna do a lot of systems where we're gonna, we're gonna have to translate from the rotational system to the linear system. And I'll do some examples, but keep these equations handy. They're here in a table, so you can keep looking these up. But on the left side of all these equations, I have the linear situation. This is arc length, which you could make a, a line or a, you know, a distance in meters. V tangential will be in meters per second. A tangential will be 
uh, in meters per second squared, just like we've used before, like one famous one is 9.8 meters per second squared. That's a straight free fall for gravity. But the, the units come out to be the same. And all you do is you take the radius of whatever circle you're in, multiply by the rotational concept to get the linear concept. All right, we'll come back to that. We're going to apply that. So that, that kind of keeps some of the equations organized. We'll use these equations quite often, especially these over here, especially these last two. All right, so now another new thing that's a little involved. I'm going to try to keep it simple and condensed here in our problems. We have this thing called rotational inertia. Most books, including ours, call that moment of inertia. I don't like the term moment of inertia, but I will probably refer to it mostly as moment of inertia. But it's rotational or angular inertia. It's the laziness to spin. It's the analogy to to the linear inertia, which is measured by mass. Something's got 50 kilograms of mass has a linear inertia measured in kilograms, 50 kilograms. It's hard to get it moving. If it's not moving, it's Newton's first law is law of inertia. Okay, if it is moving, it wants to keep moving in a straight line. We're gonna have the same thing here with rotation. If something's not spinning, it doesn't want to spin because of its inertia. And we're gonna measure the inertia with the letter, or we're gonna use the letter I to symbolize rotational inertia. So you can you can restate Newton's first law for rotation. You know, an object that's not spinning will not start spinning, and an object that is spinning will keep spinning in the same direction at constant spin rate, constant angular velocity, unless acted on by an outside torque. So torque will be the thing that makes things spin. Now torque involves force. I'll show you that in a minute. Well, we've already done some torque problems. We're going to bring that back here in a minute. But what you'll see here, you'll see this Greek letter sigma here. You don't need to memorize what that means. Uh, well, what it is, you don't need to memorize it. It's sigma. But what you do, uh, rotational inertia is the sum of all the particles in an object each particle of mass, you can break an object into parts or you can have a single part multiplied by the radius squared. So that probably makes no sense to you right now, but I'm going to explain it as it goes around, as it goes down here. Um, so I is the new letter, rotational inertia, moment of inertia. It's the new concept. The, the units will be kilograms. You want kilograms and you want meters. So always convert to kilograms and meters. That's been consistent all year. We still have mass. Now R is the radius of the object or the the context in the, in, the, in the problem I'll show you because now the shape of the objects will matter. Okay, let me explain this. Things that the hardest things to spin, the hardest things to spin are things that have the mass far out. One example would be like, and we kind of used this example a while ago, like the baton, or just stick with two weights on the end, stick with two weights on the end, like if you're in a marching band, the people in the front. They're called the, what, the major, I don't know if they're called the majors or whatever. They have, but they have these baton twirlers, all right? They have two weights on the end of a stick. If we ignore, if we ignore the stick right now, I mean, the stick is there, but let's say that the stick itself has very little mass, it's lightweight. The two weights at the end are pretty heavy, all right? They, they have a pretty good mass. So um, in that case, like if you have a stick with two masses, if you're ignoring the stick and somebody has their hand in the middle and try to spin it, they try to spin it. Well, the more masses you have at the end, the harder it is to spin that thing. And you literally, to calculate the moment of inertia, the difficulty of spin for that particular stick, and that's one of the easiest kinds of things to maybe imagine, is you take the mass of those two, two things at the end. You could do them one at a time, or you could do them both. That's what this sum, summation means. This means summation. It's sigma. It means to add both of those. It means to add both masses. But you could do them separately. You could do one mass times its radius squared, get that value. So if it asked you, what is the moment of inertia or rotational inertia for one of those masses? You just simply put in that mass, and, and they might be two different masses, because actually in real life they are different masses. There's one that's a little bit bigger than the other on, the, on that's, that baton, all right? But they both have the same radius from the center. So if my hand is at the center, I have the radius to where the mass is. You basically call that a point mass. It's a mass that's all concentrated almost one spot. It's got a little bit of size, but we like the center of gravity problems, you make it one mass at its center. So you could take each mass times its radius squared. So the bigger one would have a little bit bigger mass, same radius. You would calculate that. Then you would do the other one, calculate that, and then add them up. This means to add all the pieces if you have a couple of different pieces together. Well, in real life, there's a lot of different scenarios of different types of objects you'll see down on the page here. 
that I pulled out of the book. But bottom line is, in all these scenarios down here, these equations, at the end of the day, the value for i, the, the, the difficulty to spin something if it's not already spinning, or to stop it if it is spinning, right, has nothing to do with gravity, it has to do with the mass. All these things would work equally as well in outer space. Even when there's no gravity, it'd be, when there's no gravity, it's still hard to spin a baton. And the more mass you have, or the bigger the radius, the radius is a huge thing. If you double the radius, if you double the radius of something, double this number, it becomes squared. It makes the, the, the moment of inertia quadruple. Because if you take something and double it and then square it, what if you triple it and square it? It becomes nine times what it used to be. We did some examples like that with gravity, uh, Newton's law of universal gravity. If you make R five times bigger, then I becomes 20, 25 times bigger because five squared is 25. That's, that's a mathematical argument. It's not really, well, it comes up in physics, but it's really uh, math, a math concept. So here we have some different scenarios, and, and we're going to apply these to a bunch of example problems here in a few minutes. If you have a basic ring, a basic ring, so what they're doing in all these diagrams, this green line here represents the axis of spin. Now, it, like this is like, for example, this is like, like a ring that you put on your finger, a ring you put on your finger, right? And like your finger is that green line. So that's the, the axis you're gonna spin your ring around, okay? So when you have a ring, rings, rings basically are the maximum configuration for moment of inertia. They're the hardest things to spin given a given mass because all the mass is on the maximum distance from the axis. So literally, the equation is I equals MR squared. There's no multiplier. There's gonna be some multipliers you'll see here in a few minutes. Okay, because in a, with a ring, and to prove all these things requires calculus. That's another level of physics that would be a year or two away if you're going to take advanced physics. You have to use. We're not going to use any calculus here. We're just going to use trig and algebra. Don't don't get worried. We're not going to do anything even close to calculus. We're still going to just stick with trig and algebra, geometry, basic geometry. This is it. Really, is kind of a geometry thing. This is a, this is a, a hoop, a ring. Okay and you're spinning it about its the center like where your finger would be. But for example, if you have like a, a solid cylinder, like, a, um, like a, a can that's solid, or a, well, I mean, if you think of like a can of soda, but the, the soda is frozen, so it's solid. There's no liquid inside there, all right? If it rolls on a table, if it rolls on a table, a solid disc, or a solid cylinder like this, its I value is one half MR squared. So it still has the MR squared. So all of these diagrams I'm going to show you all have an MR squared. You take the mass of the object, in this case times the radius of the object, but you divide by two. So this one's easier to spin for its given mass, easier to rotate about that axis that goes through its center than this one. Then there's also different ways to spin things. For example, you could take that same can that I'm circling right here all right, and have an axis that goes to its center, and you try to spin it like a, like the spinner on a top, like spin it around this vertical axis. Well, now it's easier to spin that way because the I value is only one twelfth ml squared. Right, this number, if you calculate it, will be a smaller number than the one above it, even if it was the same mass, and the same length, and the same object. All right, it will be. Um, uh, well, that's a thin rod. That's a thin rod. Okay, whereas opposed to if you have a, a, a solid cylinder or disc about the central axis, you have another complication. We probably won't do that one. We'll be doing this one. Like I have a problem set up like that. We're not going to get into the more complicated ones. Where you have like up here where you have um, a disc that has a thickness or a, um, a ring that has a thickness. So we won't be doing those two, but bear in mind there's a bunch of other more complicated ones. We're going to be sticking with like this one and this one. Actually, I think there's one problem on the homework where it's a motorcycle tire that you got to do this one for, where there's an inner, so yeah, sorry about that. They, it'll tell you the inner radius of the motorcycle tire is 40 centimeters and the outer radius is 50 centimeters, so you will have to plug in two numbers. Yeah, there's a motorcycle problem that you use this one for. Just heads up, you'll be using this equation for the motorcycle wheel problem. Okay, then you have things that spin and roll. Um, this is a solid sphere. 
you know, through a diameter, and there's I think one homework problem where it's the Earth. Like you get to do, you have to apply this to the Earth, and the Earth spins every day. So the Earth spins every day. So that's going to ask you about the calculate this value for the Earth. You have to look up the mass of the Earth, the radius of the Earth in meters, the mass of the Earth in kilograms, and the 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 rotational inertia, the moment of inertia, is just going to be two fifth times the mass of the Earth times the radius of the Earth squared. So that's just a straight plug-in, but you got to look those numbers up. They don't tell you in the problem. Can't remember which number that is in the homework. This one over here is a thin shell that's hollow, basically. So it's a little bit different than a solid sphere. So you got to read these carefully. But this is the one you use for the Earth. Here's one where you like you're spinning the hoop with an axis perpendicular to like a, along a, a radius, as opposed to around like where your finger would be. So then it's one half m r squared. So. Uh, if you're ever in doubt as to which one to use, read them carefully and with practice. We're going to try to stick with the easiest ones. We, I, we're not, I, we will not do a square plate or a rectangular plate. We will not do that. We might do a hollow sphere. So if it's a hollow sphere, you use this equation. If it's a solid sphere, you use this equation. Okay, uh, this is actually out of your book. It's from figure 10.12. It's right out of the book. And there's a bunch of other configurations. If you go online, there's all kinds of other shapes of things, triangles and other crazy shapes that um, cubes that give you crazy equations uh, but these will all always be supplied for you. You can always look those up on a test or homework. Okay, now a little bit of review first. Torque. Torque is R cross F. So it's RF sine theta. We did that in I think unit 8 or 9. I think it was 9. Um, so that's, we're still going to have torque. Torque is what can cause rotational acceleration. If the torques are balanced, like in the previous unit, then we have, they're at rest. That's what we started with, like the teeter-totter problems and all the, all the other problems where we wanted to be in equilibrium. Now we're not going to be in rotational equilibrium. These things are going to speed up or slow down. So that's an old equation right here on the left, but here's the new equation. Torque net equals I alpha. That is the analogous to Newton's second law. Newton's second law for linear is F net equals MA. This is the same equation. It's torque net equals ma. Well, now the mass is not m, it's i. So we're using i for the mass and alpha for the acceleration. It's the same equation. It's the same type of problem. You do f net equals ma, but in rotation. So the problems will look very, very similar, just with different letters, and that's the confusing part where we'll need practice. Same thing for angular momentum. Now for linear momentum, for linear momentum, we have the letter p. And that's why I have things organized in a table below here because there's a lot, a lot of new letters here. So for linear momentum, we have P equals MV. That's the M and the V are easy there, but the P was difficult. That was linear momentum. But this is the same analogous equation and all the problems are the same for rotation, that there's conservation of momentum. But now we're using L for angular momentum equals MV. Well, IV, well, not V, it's omega. So it's the same equation, but the different letters which I'll show you in this tip. In fact, I can show you that one in the table already. I'll come back. So, for example, linear momentum down here, P equals MV. Now we have angular momentum, L equals I omega. So in this table, I'll come back to the other ones. But if you, here, here are the anal analogies, because these problems are going to look very similar to what we've done before, but we're changing the letters. So the biggest issue here is trying to get used to the letters and the symbols. For linear displacement, we have delta X. Now we have rotation, delta, theta. For linear velocity, we have V. For angular velocity, we have omega. For linear acceleration, A. For rotational acceleration, alpha. So all these bottom ones are for rotation. It's all the same types of problems, same format of the equations as you'll see as we go along here. L linear, uh, linear mass, M. Angular mass, I. Linear momentum, P. Angular momentum, L. So, so on and so forth. Now instead of F net, we have torque net. So these two equations really are Newton's second law. This one's Newton's second law for linear. This is Newton's second law for rotation. It takes a net torque to make something rotate. If the torques are balanced, it'll stay stationary if it's not already moving. It'll stay in equilibrium. So once again, analogies for momentum. Impulse, we'll come back to that. Here's one that's really obvious, the last one, kinetic energy. Linear kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared. It's the same equation for rotation. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Well, instead of m, it's i, because i is the replacement letter, replacement constant. It's the rotational mass times the rotational velocity squared. So it's pretty, it's really obvious here. That's the same equation with just different 
symbols. And the units are a little bit different as well. And we'll get to that. I'll do the concrete examples. But to go back up again here. So I talked about angular momentum. Then we have angular impulse, which would be torque net times time instead of force net times time, which was the linear impulse. If you go back to that table down here, linear impulse is F average times time, and that causes the change in momentum. That's a review. So one thing nice about this unit, it's the last unit, it's, it's going to review some of the things we've had before, and there's a lot going on in this five weeks. And this is going to be a little bit of a review, trying to pull some pieces together. So, oh, one more thing about linear momentum. There's an alternate equation. Uh, ang this is angular momentum. Angular momentum. It's MRV. I'll give you an example of that uh, if it comes up. That's an alternate equation. Using, you can prove that, but we don't need to prove that right now. And then I also mentioned that. Okay, angular impulse causes a change in angular momentum, just like linear impulse causes a change in linear momentum. Okay, then we have one of the, probably the easier ones here. It'll be obvious when they ask you, calculate the kinetic energy of this rotating object. Well, you just plug in the I value and uh, its current speed, its current instantaneous speed. So let's apply some of this. Oh, before I apply it. These were the kinematics linear uniform acceleration equations from unit two and three. And we've been using them since then as well. But these equations over here are the same equations. I've just changed the letters. You can look at them. I'm not going to go through them with a fine tooth comb right now. We'll come back to them. But there's the same five equations, and this, it's going to be the same problem solving technique. And we will go through that methodically here in a few minutes. And then, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, law of conservation of angular momentum, it's the same application as the law of conservation of linear momentum. But this one's with torque. With no external torques, the net angular momentum of a system does not change. It stays constant. All right, so now it's time for the examples. All right. So I have a lot of examples here because even though there's a lot of similarities to linear, there's a lot of things to keep track of with all these new letters. So let's go through this methodically. Here we go. Everything's, everything is summarized on those previous pages. So hopefully you can print those out, have those in front of you. As we go through this, I can, I can scroll back, but I'll write down the, the, the important equations each time off those pages that I just went through. Here it says a ball of that diameter rolls without slipping. How many revolutions did it make in the process? Some of these are just kind of common sense problems in a, in, a, in a sense, right? So here we have a ball, okay? It's supposed to be the center of the ball. And the ball rolls along the floor, all right? So it rolls along the floor. Um, so yes, there are equations involved here, but this is better done conceptually. You just gotta, I mean, you think about this. If a ball rolls, if it rolls through one revolution, this ball, I'll write that down. One revolution for this ball, or any ball, but this ball in particular. One revolution. How far does it roll? How far forward along this road, it's starting at this spot right here, we call it point A on the floor. Okay, how far does it go to get to point, I mean, how far does it go if it rolls around one time and ends over, um, it goes around one rotation and ends up, I'll just draw it like a, like an imaginary, that's where it goes to. Okay, it gets to point B, where the same spot on the ball, so here, this spot right here, as the ball rotates, that ball, that point that I just highlighted with blue will go, as the ball rolls, it'll go up and around and get, and it'll get back, it'll get back to this spot right here. But in one revelation, revolution, rotation, how far does this ball go? Well, it goes one circumference. This ball goes one circumference in one rotation. So that's kind of my the concept that's very important, the circumference the circumference equals 2 pi r. C stands for circumference. So in one revolution, the ball goes through one circumference. All right, That linear distance from A to B will be one circumference. So in this case, it'll be C equals 2 times pi times the radius of the ball. Make sure it's in meters and make sure it's the radius. The diameter here is 30 centimeters, but the radius is 0.15 meters. Okay, The radius is 15 centimeters, half the diameter. So watch out for that. So this ball, in one revolution, 
has a circumference in meters of uh, 0.94 meters. It goes along the ground 0.94 meters. And the middle of the ball goes that far as well. That's how far the, the middle of the ball goes from here to here as it rolls. So this path on the ground is 0.94 meters. I should put the units on that. So here's where you gotta use your common sense now. If it goes that many meters in one revolution, the ball's gotta go a total of 68 meters. It, it goes almost one revol almost one meter in one spin, one rotation. So it has to go through at least 68 rotations to get to 68 meters, a little bit more than that. So how do you figure it out? Well, you just take the total, the total distance it has to go. So here's where the common sense goes, comes in. You're gonna take 68.5 meters all right, that you have to go total, divided by 0 0.94. And if you want to put units in here, which you don't have to do, that's meters per rotation. ROT means rotation. So when you divide that, it gives you a number. It gives you a number of rotations. And when you do that in this case, 68.5 meters over 0.94 meters per rotation, it gives you 73 rotations. Or revolutions. That's the answer. One other way to look at this one. Another way to look at this one um, is, um, well, you you could say um, let's just stick with that. That's a, that's a good way to look at that. I mean, just just do it by common sense. You get to go sixty-eight point five meters, and you divide. And it's just a little over 68 meters. Let's not complicate with another alternate way. Because there are other ways of doing this. If there's a better way you, you can do it to get this answer, do it. But that's, that's just, this is a good way to do it. Okay, here's another one. Here's another one. A video disc. We used to have these video discs. You probably still have them, you know, in your DVD player. You can still rent them, obviously, from Redbox and stuff like that. And you put them in there, and they spin. I don't know if this is a, really a reasonable number, but that's a lot That's a lot of RPMs. That's, that's spinning pretty fast. I mean, re old records were like 78 RPMs. Well, actually, the new ones, the newer ones, back in the 60s and 70s, were 33 RPMs. You got more material on them. But a video disc, let's say 18, 1,800 RPMs, that's a lot. It's spinning. All right, so once again, there's a lot of kind of conceptual stuff we got to think about. So this is the disc. It's spinning. Now, it's spinning in a horse, like a bump. Now, looking down, it's not rolling on the ground like the tire was, the wheel, or the ball in the previous problem. So the previous problem could be a ball or a wheel would have been the same answer. Anyways, you're looking down from above, and it's spinning at 1,800 RPMs. Now, whenever you get these problems that talk about RPMs, you really want to convert those right away to radians per second. So this will, we'll be doing this a lot, and you'll be taking a lot of shortcuts as we go through this. But let me show you the shortcut. We have... 1800, well, let me show you the, the meaning behind this. This is rotations, RLT means rotations, RPM, rotations per minute. That's what, that's RPM, that's what that means with that. Rotations, the line means per, and then minutes. And I want to get this to radians per second. So it's kind of like a conversion. It's really what it is. It's a conversion. I know that one rotation, one rotation is 2 pi r meters. Okay, I, well, I don't want to do meters. Okay, you could do meters. This is sorry about that. I want to do radians. It's radians. Two pi r would be the meters. Okay, uh, the distance in meters, but two pi radians. So one full circle is two pi radians. That's a conversion because I, the rotations will cancel. If I did the math right here right now, I would get radians per minute, but I want radians per second. I don't want meters per second. That's why I got rid of the radius there. I want a radius. I know two pi radians is one rotation. All right, and then uh, one minute is 60 seconds. Okay, well, I don't have to do anything more. I can do the math now because the minutes cancel out. It'll come out in radians per second. And if you do the math there, that comes out to be 190, the two sig figs, 190 radians I say radians, R-A-D, you can spell the whole thing out, but R-A-D, radians per second. That's the rotational speed in standard units. That's the units we want. 
all right? Now, if the beam is 12 centimeters from the center of the disc, so there's, what happens is a laser disc above this, or usually it's below it, okay? Um, looking down, and there's a, so there's a laser disc, and usually they're, they're red lasers, but the, the fancier ones are blue, blue disc, blue lasers, blue ray. But the, but the disc, the, the laser looks down, the, the laser looks down, okay, there's a blue dot, that should be a blue dot, and this distance right here, right now, is 12 centimeters. That's probably unreasonable, but I should have picked a smaller number, but that's okay, 12 centimeters. Okay, so if you go back up to those equations, if you go back up to those equations at the very top, and I mentioned here's some of the more important ones, but the one that's going to be important here is going to be V tangential equals R omega, because we have to go from the linear, from the rotational to the linear. I have the rotational speed here. This, this 90 radians per second, that's omega. That's the rotational speed, 190 radians per second. That's the, that's the given rotational speed. It's constant right now. Well, my tangential speed for that point there, right, the tangential speed, which will be this direction, tangent to the circle. If I have a little circle, I'm drawing a little circle here. I'll draw it in blue. All right. It's making a circle. It's tangential velocity, which is what I'm looking for. That tangential velocity is going to be the radius at which that point is at, 12 centimeters, 0.12 meters, times the rotational speed, 190 radians per second. So the tangential velocity here of that point, if you multiply that, is uh, 23 meters per second. 23 meters per second. That's quite a bit. That's like 40 miles per hour. All right, that's my tangential speed. It's not the final answer, but it's the tangential speed. Um, now it says, the problem actually says, how many meters of data pass beneath the beam in 0.12 seconds? Well, this is just V equals D over T now. For, li for linear, we have V equals well, delta X over T, or distance over time. All right, we're looking for delta X. How much distance or displacement delta X equals V times T? So I'm going to plug in here. So I'm looking for delta X equals my velocity, 23, times the time, 0.12 seconds. So my total distance traveled, so this is from unit 2. This, this equation here is from unit 2. You know, linear velocity equals displacement over time. Distance over time. Speed equals distance over time. Same application here. So delta X, the total distance of data that passes beneath the beam comes out to be uh, 28 meters? No. 2.8 meters. 2.8 meters. Can't be 28. 2.8 meters of data. And that's your answer there. Let's practice some more here. All right, this is a this is a fan, a whole house, a fan that you might put in the attic of your house to to cool down your house before, uh, well, so you don't have to use your air conditioning. It doesn't really matter what kind of fan it is. But there's a motor here that has a pulley, a wheel, with a belt. There's a belt, I don't know if you can see it, there's a belt that goes to this, there's a pulley over here, a round object that's attached to a shaft that's then attached to the fan that spins, but there's a belt that rotates from one, from the motor, the electric motor, to this pulley over here and spins that thing and let's say it's a one speed fan. It gives me the speed of the motor. The motor, it says this, the motor spins at 105 RPMs. Okay, so once again, a lot of these things are getting used to these terms. That's kind of what I'm going for here in addition to um, getting ready to solve the, the, the deeper level problems. This is the conceptual stuff. And there will be a fair amount of this conceptual stuff on the test, and we've got to get used to this. We need to practice this. All right, it says a lot of information. Um, but one of the things, right away, whenever I see these RPMs, I convert immediately I convert, convert immediately to radians per second. It's going to be the same calculation every time, basically. I have 105. The given motor is 105 rotations per minute, and you'll see a shortcut as I go through this. One rotation... One rotation is 2 pi radians. One rotation, so that's rotation, rotation. And then I multiply by 1 minute is 60 seconds. So I do this every time. So you multiply by 2 pi and divide by 60. And the shortcut would be 
multiply by pi and divide by 30. It's the same calculation every time. So it comes out in radians per second. So basically if you take your ro uh, rotations per minute and multiply by 2 pi divide by 60, or if you have if you want to get to if you want to do the opposite, then you would multiply by 60 and, and divide by 2 pi if you had the because there's one problem in the homework where you have to convert from radians per second back to rotations per minute. It's just the reverse operations. You'd multiply by the 60 and divide by the 2 pi. You'd line it up kind of like this. I'm not going to do that right now, but one of those might come up. We do the math here. Uh, that comes out to be 11 radians per second. 11 radians per second. That's the rotational speed of this uh, motor pulley, the motor itself. All right, now there's a lot going on here. So here's the thing. Um, I'm going to draw this out a little bit here. Let me give myself some space. The fan, the fan. This one looks like it's got four blades, so this is going to be my poor attempt to draw the fan. Okay, so here's the middle of the fan that has blades. Okay, so this is supposed to be the blades. And it says that the fan blades, the fan blades, let's see, try to get a different color, have a radius from the center of where it rotates to where the tip of the blade is to be 75 centimeters, 0.75 meters. All right, and the fan blades are going to go in a circle. They're going to rotate. And once again, there's a couple different approaches to this problem, but here's the approach that'll work. It says we do we don't want that fan blade tip to exceed. So up here, I'm going to circle it. The tip of the blades we don't want to exceed 62 meters per second, 6.2 meters per second. A point on the tip here. Well. Okay, and they give you the radius. So what I can do is I can figure out, if I look at the equation, v, that's my V tangential, equals R omega. I don't want the, th the tip of that blade, that blue dot there, to exceed 6.2. So let's put it to the max. Let's say that that is 6.2. 6.2. And it's at a radius of 0.75. So that can tell me then what the maximum, that'll be the maximum rotational speed. So omega max is 6.2 divided by um, 0.75, which is 8.3, 8.3 radians per second. So that's my maximum omega. All right. So that's not the answer because the problem asks me how big, how big does this pulley have to be on that's connected to the fan. So there's a pulley back there with a belt on it that connects from the electric motor to the fan, and then that pulley on the fan is connected to the fan blades. So there's like three things here. But here are some important ideas. Two things that are connected together, okay? Wheels connected together, like this pulley, it's a wheel, it's a, it's a circle, connected to the fans have the same omega, okay? So in other words, omega, omega for the fan, it's spinning, the rate at which it spins is equal to omega for the pulley that's attached to it. They, they, are, they are attached together. They spin. They both spin together. They spin at the same rate, whatever it is, 500 RPMs, 200 RPMs, 100 RPMs. They have the same spin rate. What's different is how, if you go further out, you have a bigger tangential velocity. The further out you are, you have a bigger tangential velocity. But if you have two things that are spinning together, okay, they have the same omega. Now, the the little pulley that's on the motor over here has a different omega. It's on a different motor. It's not spinning at the same rate. If it's a smaller pulley, it's got to spin faster to keep up with the bigger ones. It's got to go through some more spins, okay? So smaller things have to spin faster. But two things connected together, okay, spin the same. But what's true about two things connected by a belt? If you're connected by a belt or a chain, let me put this down here. Uh, if you're connected by a belt or chain, okay, or chain, okay, this is, that means V tangential number one equals V tangential number two. 
They each have the same tangential velocity. So if they're connected by a belt or I should say chain there. Not, I don't know why I have a T there. Chain. All right. So they have the same tangential velocity. If they're connected together for spin, they have the same omega. So those are two important concepts. This idea here and this idea here. But this second circle is for things connected by a chain or belt. They have the same tangential velocity because every point is spinning at the same tangential speed because of the belt that connects from one to the other. So this is an important thing you got to think about here. Visualize, which is a, you got to think about it for a while. All right. This little wheel right here spins at the same rate as the fan blade. They're spinning together. Okay. But for the two that are connected by the belt, they have the same tangential speed. The smaller pulley will spin faster. So I know already that this maximum was 8.3. 8.3 radians per second. Well, that means that this is 8.3 because of the same. Uh, radians per second. That was the maximum. All right, now, if we go back to this equation up here, I'll write it in blue again. Okay, I'll bring it down. Okay, we have V tangential equals R omega. All right, so I'm going to pull some things together here now. V tangential equals R omega. So now what that's saying is this. R1 omega 1 equals R2 omega 2. Let me pause and say that again. Because this, this is going to solve the problem now. The tangential velocity of any point on a spinning object is R times omega. So for VT1, it's R1 omega 1. For VT2, so you take r times omega to get that velocity. And here I'm doing number one. Number one, let's say, is my motor. Okay, so let's use number uh, motor is number one. And uh, the pulley on the fan, the fan pulley, is number two in my, in my analysis over here in this part. I know everything but one thing. I know the radius of my, I think I know the radius of my um, pulley on the motor. All right. Um, and it said, oh, and I know, yeah, I know the, I know everything but the radius of the fan pulley. So the, 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 the it tells me the motor pulley has a diameter of 22 centimeters. So its radius is 11. So this is 11, 11 centimeters, 0.11. I know omega 1, I already got that in the proper units, which is 8.3. No. Uh, yes. No, sorry, it was 11. 11 is the, uh, the 8.3 is for the fan. The 11 is for the motor. So, so that's 11 here. That's the motor speed. We're looking for the radius of the fan pulley and the maximum, so the 8.3 is the pulley speed in radians per second. So the motor speed was 11, we calculated at the beginning. The motor radius is 0.11. The fan pulley, we're looking for the radius and its speed at maximum is 8.3. So if you do the math there, you get R2, the radius of that pulley, comes out to be, it's a lot of work, 0.15 meters. That's the radius of that pulley. Does it say for diameter or, or radius? Uh, oopsie, sorry. Uh, what size should it be? Well, it has a radius of 0.15 meters, diameter of 30 centimeters. All right. Thanks for sticking with that one. And we will come back and practice uh, in the next unit of notes on more applications of rotational or angular kinematics with moment of inertia.